In the summer of 1895, John Selman Sr. gunned down John Wesley Harden. Considered one of the deadliest shooters of the Old West, Harden killed his first man at the tender age of 15. In the decade that followed, dozens of others would fall to the young man's guns, including, if the legend is true, a victim whose only crime was snoring a little too loud. Yet despite Wes Harden's massive body count and a willingness to resort to violence at the drop of a hat, John Selman, his killer with a badge, was far worse. And today, you're gonna learn why. My name's Josh, and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. John Henry Selman was born in Madison County, Arkansas on November 16, 1839. His family, like many others, made the migration to Texas, and after his daddy's death in 1861, Selman enlisted in the Confederate Army, specifically the 22nd Texas Cavalry. Not sure how much action Selman saw, though, as by 1863, he had already deserted. Got hitched to a gal named Edna in August of 65, and it weren't long before the happy couple relocated to the Fort Griffin area, where Selman began working as a deputy for Sheriff John Larne. Located about 160 miles west of Dallas, Fort Griffin had such a penchant for violence that it was often referred to as the Babylon on the Brazos. It's where Doc Holliday first met Wyatt Earp, and counted among its regular visitors future legends such as Pat Garrett, Dave Rudabaugh, and the aforementioned John Wesley Arden. So lawless was the area that a vigilance committee known as the Tin Hat Brigade arose up and began doing their thing. And by doing their thing, I mean mostly lynching presumed criminals without due process. And it was as a vigilante with the Tin Hat Brigade that John M. Larn made his bones and secured the position of sheriff. In addition to keeping the peace, Larn also had a beef contract with the army. Weren't long before the sheriff and his new deputy, our very own John Selman, began procuring the cattle they delivered to the garrison by any means necessary. Local ranchers began noticing that their herds were thinning while Sheriff Larn seemed to be doing just fine and the jig was up. Believe it or not, no charges were brought against the sheriff or Selman, although both men did suddenly find themselves out of a job. So naturally, they just went all in on the rustling, taking pot shots at any ranchers or cowboys who tried to interfere. One of these bullets, fired by the former sheriff, struck a rancher's arm, and John Lawrence soon found himself chained up in the jailhouse that he once had the run of. His former Confederates in the Tin Hat Brigade found out and went to pay him a visit, but their efforts were somewhat curtailed by the shackles. Seems they couldn't figure out a way to remove Lawrence from his cell in order to string him up proper, so they improvised and just filled him full of lead right there in the jail. The end result was the same and no more cattle was stolen by John M. Larn. As you can imagine, his air quotes deputy, John Selman, figured this was a good time to make himself scarce, so he drifted west into New Mexico. Lincoln County, New Mexico. Right as the damn Lincoln County War was just ramping up. Selman chose not to take a side, though. Repenting of his ways and condemning his past actions, John instead worked with local ministers as a mediator of sorts, urging peace from both factions and repeatedly placing himself in harm's way, his only protection, a leather-bound Bible, and his unwavering faith in the good Lord. And no, of course that's not true. While Selman wouldn't fight on behalf of either side, Dolan's men or the regulators, he definitely did not change his ways none. Matter of fact, his evil proclivities seemed to kick into overdrive. What's that old saying? In the midst of every crisis lies an opportunity? Well, I guess Selman saw a chance to make some easy money in a land embroiled in the chaos of war, and he dove in head first. Formed his own gang known as Selman Scouts, and they took to terrorizing the countryside, especially the Hispanic communities. And these guys were just unnecessarily savage. Case in point, they once murdered a farmer and his teenage son after asking for and receiving watermelons just killed him dead. I don't know about you, but where I'm at, we have been going through one of the hottest summers on record. And this time of the year, a nice ripe watermelon is most definitely my fruit of choice. It's truly a gift from God on a hot day, and just to think of these scallywags sitting back and enjoying that delicious heavenly nectar after murdering the very people that gave it to them, eh, it just rubs me the wrong way. And sadly, that's not the least of it. The scouts would burn down ranches for no apparent reason other than pure meanness. And if you were lucky enough to escape with just the clothes on your back, well, think again. 
One poor farmer was stripped of everything he had, even his clothes, and forced to run naked as a jaybird through the brush. But even he was luckier than the next victims, three young Hispanic kids, one of whom had Down syndrome. They made the mistake of objecting to Selman stealing their father's horses, so he shot them all dead. Then there was the murder of 14-year-old Gregorio Sanchez, and who knows who else that wasn't recorded that we don't know about. We are aware of what happened at the Bartlett Ranch, though, located just 11 miles from Fort Stanton. Selman and his scouts took the wives of two Bartlett employees, made them undress, and then the sons of bitches had their way with them. When word got out, Lincoln County residents were rightfully outraged. You know, stealing cows can be forgiven. Hell, even murder, right? Especially out west. But rape, or taking advantage of women, even among hardened killers, is often considered an inexcusable atrocity. News of these events spread to Fort Stanton, and Colonel Dudley wrote to his superiors, hoping to intervene. Fun little side note. In the letter Dudley wrote to then-Governor Axtell, he misspelled the word rustlers as wrestlers. I'm sure this was a simple mistake, but how funny would that be if there was just a rogue group of WWE wrestlers roaming around Lincoln County wrecking havoc? Let me tell you something, brother. All you Hulkamaniacs out there better listen up. I'm going to steal some horses, brother, okay? And then I'm going to steal some cows, brother. All you lawmen better take heed. And all of you out there on the regulator side, I'd say come on down too, brother, because we're going to steal some horses. And we're going to steal some cows, brother. Woo! <clears throat> wow. Not very good at my uh, Hulk Hogan impersonation, but I think you get the drift, right? With their egregious crimes in the limelight, the scouts found themselves hounded everywhere they went and ended up getting in so many damn fights that they ran out of ammo. And when they headed into town to buy some more, they were met by armed men and chased all around the countryside. Finally, Juan Patron and his militia, the Lincoln County Rifles, found the bandits camped on the Pecos River and charged, shooting the hell out of them. Of those who escaped death, five were arrested, and at least one, the slippery John Selman, was able to escape entirely. By this point, the Lincoln County War was coming to an end, and seeing as how Governor Lou Wallace did not include Selman in his blanket amnesty, the outlaw judiciously decided to skedaddle back to Texas, where, incidentally, he came down with a pretty nasty case of the smallpox. Unfortunately, he lived, and the pox turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Literally. The fresh pock marks, coupled with the shaving of his trademark beard, helped Selman to make himself unrecognizable to any law that was out there hunting him. Leaning into this new appearance, Selman took on the alias as Captain John Tyson and opened up a butcher shop at Fort Davis. Now remember, Selman had gotten married back in 1865. In the intervening years, his poor wife Edna bore him four children. Henry, born in 1868... William in 1870, Margarita in 1872, and John Selman Sr. in 1875. Long-suffering Edna would pass away in either 1878 or 79, I believe from complications following a stillbirth, at which point Selman pretty much abandoned his children, sticking them with his in-laws as he continued his outlaw ways. John would remarry, though, to a gal named Nicanora, who had helped nurse him back to health after he got the pox. He also sent for his old compadres over in New Mexico, including Jesse Evans, Billy the Kid's sometimes friend and sometimes enemy. The scheme was pretty simple. With Selman posing as a butcher there at Fort Davis, he naturally had inside information as to the size and movements of various local cattle herds. John would then report these findings to Evans and his gang so they could steal them. The boys were a little too efficient, however, and Selman soon found himself arrested by Texas Rangers and thrown in a hole. A literal hole that passed as a gel, just like the one they used to have over there in Lincoln. When it was time to stand trial, Selman was taken to Shackleford County, Texas, but the authorities there didn't want to deal with him. Instead, they put John on a horse, ordered him to leave the county, and fired a few shots in the air to let him know they were serious. A little while later, Selman pops up in Chihuahua, Mexico, running a saloon. He allegedly converted to Catholicism and sent for his kids, but only two ended up joining him. William and John Jr. With sons in tow, and I guess feeling like enough time had passed, Selman returned to New Mexico to prospect for silver. While there, he won a saloon in a card game and actually made a pretty decent living. But gamblers are going to do what gamblers do, right? Most of this money was either lost right back at the poker table or sunk into his mining interests, which didn't amount to a whole hell of a lot. 
After shooting someone in an argument, Selman was once again on the move without a damn penny to his name. Eventually, the desperado wound up in El Paso and got married a third time to a teenage girl younger than his own damn children. He also aligned himself with a shady individual named Jim Burns, who ran a joint called the Red Light Saloon. It was known for its cribs out back where customers could visit the quote-unquote crib brides, essentially just a bunch of whores and lean-tos. El Paso was yet another town of vice and violence, especially in the Red Light District and especially in the Red Light Saloon. With an election on the horizon, Burns was worried that the town would get itself cleaned up and he'd be out of business. That being the case, he suggested that Selman run for the position of constable. Burns threw a big party the night before the election and made sure his place was stocked full of sporting gals. John Selman Jr., then just 17 years of age and working alongside his father, despite their strained relationship, was told to guard the door and let everyone in who was of voting age, but to not let them leave until they were instructed on how to vote. In other words, make sure they knew damn well on how to cast a ballot for Selman. John Jr. was then handed a club by Jim Burns, and when he asked what it was for, was told, quote, If any of them try to leave, hit them over the head and make a damn good Democrat out of them. End quote. Utilizing such tactics, it should come as no surprise that on November 15, 1892, thief, rapist, and murderer John Selman Sr. found himself elected as constable of El Paso, Texas. A couple of years later, on April 5th, 1894, a Texas Ranger by the name of Bass Outlaw got drunk and started raising all kinds of hell. Believe it or not, Outlaw was his real last name. Bass, sometimes spelled like the fish, B-A-S-S, and sometimes spelled with a Z, is thought to be short for basil, or basil. Already with a few killings under his belt, the story goes that Bass carried a specially tricked out revolver, minus the trigger and several inches of the barrel. Often referred to as slip guns, these were fired by fanning or simply pulling back the hammer and letting her drop. Odd arsenal aside, Bass was considered a brave Texas Ranger and a good Southern gentleman. But unfortunately, when he got a little bit too much of that who hit John in him, he became belligerent and, more often than not, violent. So much so that his drinking had gotten him fired from the Texas Rangers, which is how he came to be in town one night sulking. In addition to drowning his sorrows, Bass was also threatening to murder a judge whom he had perceived as insulting him. John Selman Sr., who was still working as a constable, was friends with Bass, so he tried to get the drunk former ranger to go home and sleep it off. Bass refused, so they did what anybody in the right mind would do when confronted with a stalemate. Went to Tilly Howard's brothel. Bass demanded to see his favorite whore, but was informed she was currently with a client. Guess the inebriated outlaw didn't much like that answer, so he started throwing furniture, leaving Tilly no choice but to blow her police whistle. Here comes Selman again trying to calm Bass down, but he wasn't having none of it and just ran out the back door of the brothel. A gunshot followed. 23-year-old Texas Ranger Joe McKidrick heard the noise and went to investigate. He saw Bass and somewhat relaxed. After all, the two were very close friends in addition to having worked together as Rangers. Joe asked his buddy to put the gun away, and for whatever damn reason, Bass went ahead and shot McKittrick square in the face. At this point, Selman comes running outside, and Bass fans off a couple more shots, putting two rounds in the constable's thigh. John reacts, and as he's collapsing to the ground, he sends a bullet into Bass's chest, just an inch above the heart. Despite this wound, Bass Outlaw still manages to jump a fence and retreat into an alley. But just moments later, he would collapse in the arms of another Texas Ranger, Frank McMahon. Bass was then taken to a saloon and placed on a cot, asking McMahon to gather my friends around me for I know I must die. Sadly, nobody came as Bass had just shot and killed his closest friend a few minutes earlier. No word on whether or not Selman attended the former Ranger's funeral. Now I mentioned John Wesley Harden towards the beginning of this episode. He had just spent damn near two decades in prison studying law and, upon his release in early 1894, attempted to go straight. Married a 15-year-old girl named Callie, moved to El Paso, and even set up his own law office. Regrettably, Hardin's law practice failed, with one of his few clients being Deacon Jim Miller, the only verified killer with a body count comparable to his. John Wesley's marriage to his child bride didn't fare much better, lasting less than a week before young Callie went back home to Mama. For over a year, John Wesley Harden had stayed out of the saloons, but these losses brought him right back into the lion's den. 
Not long after reverting to his old ways of drinking and gambling, Hardin was hired by a lady named Beulah Morose, whose Polish cowboy husband, Martin, was imprisoned over in Juarez. Beulah claimed that her betrothed was wrongfully jailed and the $1,800 he had from the sale of his ranch stolen by Mexican authorities. Hardin was immediately smitten with Beulah and her husband's money and agreed to take the case. He also started taking Beulah to bed. That said, Hardin was successful in getting Martin Moreau's freed from jail, all part of his twisted little plan. You see, the thing is, Martin couldn't come back to the U.S. due to a $250 bounty on his head for rustling. He began meeting with Deputy Marshal George Scarborough on a plan to slip back into Texas without getting arrested and pull his wife back from the clutches of John Wesley Hardin. As such, on June 21, 1895, Martin Moreau's, disguised as a Mexican, met with Scarborough, who in turn led him across the bridge between El Paso and Juarez. Waiting for Moreau's is police chief Jeff Milton, Texas Ranger Frank McMahon, and according to some accounts, our esteemed constable John Selman Sr. And once Martin comes within range, they all just shoot him dead. Rumors began swirling that Hardin had hired the lawmen to murder Moreau's in an attempt to get his wife and money. Hell, John Wesley himself admitted as much one evening while getting drunk in an El Paso saloon. Enraged, George Scarborough forced Hardin to recant his statements in the newspaper and the past his prime gunfighter complied. While Hardin was away on business, Beulah, who I guess he was now shacked up with, got good and drunk and started raising a ruckus. She was also carrying a gun within city limits, which was a big no-no there in El Paso. John Selman Jr., now working as a constable just like his daddy, disarmed Beulah and threw her ass behind bars. And while John Wesley Hardin may have been somewhat intimidated by George Scarborough, he certainly wasn't afraid of the just 20-year-old Selman Jr. As soon as Hardin found out what the constable had done to Beulah, he caught up with the youngster and gave him a tongue lashing, along with a good old-fashioned pistol whipping an action that didn't sit too well with the homicidal John Selman Sr. As crazy and deadbeat as he was, I guess he still didn't want nobody messing with his boy. Selman went on the hunt for Hardin and found him at his usual spot in the Acme Saloon. The two damn near came to gunplay right then and there, but John Wesley was unarmed. Go get a gun, Selman challenged, to which Hardin replied, I'll go get a gun, and when I meet you, I'll meet you smoking and make you shit like a wolf around the block. And no, I did not just make that up. That's got to be one of my favorite things ever said before an Old West gunfight. Right up there with Buckshot Roberts calling Charlie Bowdry Marianne right before the fight at Blazer's Mill. I don't know about you, but I can pretty much guarantee that in the next week or so, I'm going to figure out a way to work the phrase, make you shit like a wolf around the block, into a casual conversation. At around 11 o'clock that night, Hardin was still at the Acme Saloon. Got to imagine he was pretty lit at this point and he was standing just inside the front door shooting dice for even more drinks. He rolled an unfavorable hand against the local grocer and exclaimed, Horse piss on you. The grocer told West to shake again, which he did, while exclaiming his final words. You got four sixes to beat. Shots then rang out, and the legendary gunfighter John Wesley Hardin fell to the ground. His gambling and killing days over for good. Now, it's generally accepted that John Selman Sr. shot Hardin in the back of the head before he even knew what was happening. But Selman claimed that Hardin could see him in the mirror above the bar and turned and went for his pistol before being shot. And some historians do believe that Selman did indeed shoot Hardin in the forehead. The reasoning being that the bullet hole above Hardin's eye is more consistent with an entrance wound than that of an exit wound. Either way, the bullet passed through John Wesley's head and shattered the bar mirror. Hardin fell, and Selman shot him twice more in the chest, in addition to blowing his pinky finger clear off. And he would have pumped even more shots into Hardin's lifeless body had his son John not rushed in to put a stop to things. Selman Sr. would stand trial for murder, but it ended in a hung jury. Gotta love that old West justice. I think it was pretty clear to everybody that Hardin's death was premeditated. You know, even though he had quote-unquote reformed, and spent all that time in prison, he was still considered extremely dangerous, and his many car and shooting displays on the streets of El Paso proved as much. Despite Hardin's heavy drinking, his aim was still true. Selman was released on bond to await a retrial, during which time his son, John Jr., found himself in yet another pickle. On April 4th, 1896, the youngster was thrown in jail in Juarez trying to abscond with a Mexican girl that he had fallen in love with. Certainly can't blame him there. 
Deputy U.S. Marshal George Scarborough, remember him, paid a visit to El Paso the following night, and Selman Sr. met with him. Guess Selman wanted Scarborough to help break his son out of the war as jail, much like they had done with poor Martin Moreau's a year prior. Now, during this conversation, which, by the way, was for whatever reason held in a damn alley, Selman was drunk as Scooter Brown, and things quickly went south. Scarborough claimed that they agreed on a time for the jailbreak, and Selman then invited him inside a saloon to have a drink. When George declined, Selman shouted, You goddamn son of a bitch, I'm gonna kill you. And then he went for his gun. Well, I guess George Scarborough wasn't quite as inebriated as John Selman. He cleared leather first and put four bullets into Selman's midsection before the constable was able to get off a single shot. It was April 5th, 1896, exactly two years to the day after Selman gunned down Bass Outlaw. And now I reckon it was his turn. Now Scarborough would be arrested. Uh, I guess authorities found it fishy that he was claiming self-defense when exactly zero weapons were found on Selman's body. Before George's trial, however, a known thief by the name of Cole Belmont was arrested and Selman's gun was found in his possession. He claimed to have witnessed the shooting and said that he stole the pistol before anybody arrived on the scene. Whether or not this is true or if Scarborough had somehow forced a confession is anyone's guess. Nevertheless, the deputy was acquitted, because of course he was, and soon found himself working out of Dimmy, New Mexico, where he helped to capture the famous lady bandit Pearl Hart. He also began tracking down members of the Wild Bunch, caught up with a few of them on April 1st in the year 1900, and engaged them in a little bit of old-fashioned gunplay. One of the outlaws was killed, and Scarborough took a bullet to the leg, causing it to be amputated. It was too late, though, as the poison had done set in. So it were that a few days later, on April 5th, 1900, that George Scarborough followed Bass Outlaw, John Wesley Harden, and John Selman Sr. to meet his eternal reward. Yeah, April 5th, again. If you're keeping track at home, Bass Outlaw was killed by John Selman on April 5th, 1894. A year later, on April 5th, 1895, John Selman is killed by George Scarborough. And then on April 5th, 1900, Scarborough succumbed to that wound that he received on the first of the month. Moral of the story? Stay the fuck home on April 5th. As for John Selman Jr., it's written that he was ashamed of his father, and at the time of his old man's death, despite them working together, they were not close. Jr. would go on to work for the railroad and serve with D Troop of the 11th U.S. Volunteer Cavalry during the Spanish-American War, and live all the way up to 1937. Unfortunately, I was unable to find out whether he ever married that gal from Juarez. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your continued support. And a huge thank you to the great David Lambert, who helped to inspire this episode. Do me a big favor. Check out David's artwork at patreon.com forward slash David Lambert. Link in the show notes. As well as a link to David's original thread on Mr. Selman. You can also buy him a coffee. I hear David really enjoys his coffee. You can do that by going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash David Lambert art. And you know who else enjoys coffee? Me, Josh, the host of the Wild West Extravaganza. So if you're feeling generous, go on over to buybeacoffee.com forward slash Wild West. Link in the show notes to all of this. If you'd like to hear more true tales from the Wild and Wooly West, head on over to wildwestextra.com and check out that back catalog. While you're there, hit that contact button and send me a message. Let me know what's on your mind. Or, I don't know, maybe go shit like a wolf around the block. It's totally up to you. All right, till next time, try not to shoot your best friend in the face. Don't steal anybody's watermelon. And for the love of all this holy, just stay home this coming April 5th, especially if you live in El Paso. Adios. Hey, we'll get back to the story in just a moment. But first, I got to be honest with you. I'm doing this full time now. The Wild West extravaganza is, as we speak, my job. And to tell you the truth, this is sort of a gamble. I'm gambling on myself, and I'm gambling on you. To make this work, and to continue bringing you true tales from the wild and woolly west, in an unfiltered and uncensored fashion, I'm going to need your support. And at this moment, the absolute best way you can support the Wild West extravaganza is by becoming a member of Into History. Into History is a podcast subscription channel made by history lovers for history lovers. Not only will you get to listen to the Wild West Extravaganza ad-free, but you'll gain early access before anyone else. You also get bonus content, 
There is currently Wild West extravaganza content on Into History that you cannot hear anywhere else, not even on Patreon. And there's a lot more to come. You'll also get to participate in the book club, the community forum, the upcoming live streaming events, and best of all, you won't have to hear my annoying ass voice break into the middle of a story like I'm doing right now. And guess what? You also get everything I just mentioned from all the other shows in the Into History universe, offering the same perks. Come on, what are you waiting for? Go to intohistory.com forward slash Wild West Extra. That's intohistory.com forward slash Wild West Extra to become a member today. I love you, and thank you very much for assisting me in helping to keep the Old West alive. Back to the show. Horse piss on you.